Ladies and gentlemen, honorable panel, the Cold War has supposedly ended a long time ago. Some things has, have gone for the better, but some problems remain. Russia's aggression and involvement in Eastern, in Eastern Europe has been a huge problem for the US and their international interest. Eastern European crisis will, he, will have to be dealt with by the next US president because of recent escalations and Obama's weakness in Ukraine. Now, let's examine what this is about. Alliances must be a priority to solve it, says side proposition. What are those alliances? We believe that those alliances are stronger political and economic ties guarded by bilater bilateral agreements and an official commitment to military and economic intervention in the case of a crisis. And who exactly are we talking about? We're talking about Eastern European countries, such as the Baltic states, Poland and Bulgaria, they're already allied, and countries like Belarus and Ukraine that are potential allies for the future. Now, US international policy is a complex issue. We understand and recognize that the US has several problems to deal with, such as Eastern Europe, Middle East, and our, the rise of China. Mm, no, thank you. Um, now, what we believe here is that we're going to show you that, firstly, strong alliances belong uh, and block Russian expansion in its agenda and provide stability. Secondly, that uh, safeguarding those alliances uh, in Eastern Europe provides US with space and support to combat other global problems. And thirdly, that it will prevent the rise of dangerous radical sentiments in the Eastern Europe. Now, our burden today is to show to you that strengthening and safeguarding those alliances in Eastern Europe is a priority to solving Eastern European crisis at first and safeguarding US interest abroad in other issues. Now, let's move into it. First argument here is that strong alliances will block Russian expansionist agenda. Russia has a long history of military interest in the region that predates any American involvement. When we understand this, we have to ask ourselves, what is US to do? Strengthen ties and alliances or let things be? The truth is, Obama opted for the latter, more lethargic option. And it failed, miserably. The Ukrainian crisis was a horrible situation where Russia did the unthinkable. They invaded a sovereign nation. We have to understand that this is a huge problem. The European, Europe has not been in war for decades. And this is very important because it demonstrates that, Russia's feel, that Russia fearing for its borders is a smokescreen argument. That Russia is willing to go and attack a country even when the American uh, foreign policy did not further infringe on their borders. Ukraine was trying to co connect with the European Union, trying to, 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 be, to work with them, and Russia invaded anyway without real US involvement. US involvement came later. So therefore, we see that letting things happen doesn't work and gives Russia space to, do, to go with anti-American um, uh, ideals. So it is a priority for the US to stop this immediately. I have to stress this is an urgent issue, which gives it a priority stance. And alliances are a priority situation because, sure, Russia will stump its feet and declare that this is another invasion of their borders. But the truth is, strong alliances will, 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 will guarantee, uh, with guaranteed US and NATO support, will prevent Russia from going anywhere or doing any more direct harm. Why? Russia is a middle school bully in this situation. And a strong and an older brother policy will stop them. Russia is a pragmatic country. They are more. They will not engage on such a conflict. But not strengthening the alliances gives them the Ukrainian example case. It gives them space to do whatever they want with too long response time from the West. Now, when we see this, if we had, if this had been done before, if alliances had been strengthened and guarantees would have been put in place. Russia would not have dared invade Ukraine. So we, we understand that this is an immediate danger Sir, and a clear priority. Please. Is Russia the first country that takes an active position, or is it just reacting to the American position in Eastern Europe? Well, in Ukrainian crisis, we clearly see that America had very little involvement. Ukraine was trying to move towards European Union. America really didn't do much there. And Russia was the attacker. Russia was the first one to strike. We see that. Uh, Ukraine rebelled against a president that was pressured into, into moving back to Russia by Russian strength and interest. And we understand this is another problem and another reason why there must be 
uh, uh, U.S. alliances in the region because Russia is extremely powerful and can uh, blackmail countries uh, by their military strength. Now, second argument. Um, in our second argument, um, we have to understand that strengthening and safeguarding alliances in Eastern Europe provides the U.S. with space and support to combat other global problems. It is the priority of alliances in Eastern Europe is further reinforced by benefits it provides to U.S. interest in the long run, which I'll explain right now. As seen, European Union is, uh, European, Eastern Europe is not the only crisis, but alliances must be a priority because, first, they remove Russian leverage. Russia has been known to pressure America concerning the uh, Eastern European crisis. And we know that once those alliances are in place, Russia will no longer be able to blackmail America on other global problems such as Middle East and China because of this region being secure and America taking a strong stance. This is important because it gives U.S. breathing space. It forces, uh, and it, they can therefore focus in the long run on other problems that this would prevent them from focusing on because of a constant threat and a constant danger of Russia doing more harm close to home and endangering Europe. Now, second, this can simply be addressed because this is very important for stabilizing Europe. Now, I am claiming this is crucial for U.S. interest here because it frees Europe's hands, not only America's. You have to understand that Europe is a categorically better ally to the U.S. than Russia could be. Why? Because they have, firstly, no need to worry about Russia close to home um, because of U.S. stepping in and showing itself to, to be a strong ally, willing to help Europe. And secondly, because U.S. provides itself, pr proves itself here, to be a trustworthy ally. It proves itself not to be a, uh, not to just lean back and let things sort themselves out. Europe is currently afraid. We have to understand that Europe is largely panicking because of its afra of being afraid of Russia and its economic might and military might. And in this situation, this is relevant because Europe can help America more in international problems later on. Firstly, because they're ideologically close. America and Russia have tried to cooperate for decades and been largely unsuccessful in the Middle East, in the questions of China, and so on. We believe that it's better for the US to go ahead and rather leave Russia aside and, and provide a stronger Western bloc that will be able to deal with those issues. We've seen that already on issues like ISIS, the European Union and America have strong interests together. And if America proves itself to be trustworthy, European Union can easily uh, return the favor. Now, secondly, and finally, U.S. ensures its central role in international relations in the long run. It strengthens the Western bloc economically, which can help it combat China, and uh, push itself in the center of new international politics. Therefore, we have proven you here that we have fulfilled our burden in the case that first, alliances are an immediate necessity to resolve an Eastern European crisis, that there are ways to stabilize the region, and they provide space and support to deal with other issues later on. Thank you. Russia is not a perpetrator, Russia is only a reactor. This is the team line of team opposition today, through which we are going to prove to you that Russia does not make the first step into aggression at any point, but just reacts to the aggression of the Western bloc, which is manifested through, dip through diplomatic and military actions at the end of the day. The metric of this debate that we as team opposition stand by is that the metric of this debate should be how we are keeping the geostrategic balance of power in the region in the next four years and or for the next presidential mandate. We believe today that which team is going to prove to you in which way we're keeping the balance of powers that that team should win the debate. Our case is going to be as follows. I'm going to present two arguments to you. First of all is going to be how and the, and the mechanism through which Russia is just reacting to the aggression of the Western bloc. The second argument which, has, which I'm going to bring to you is about, is about the influence of cultural factors and my colleague is going to talk about the par paradigms of the population in the Eastern European bloc and how they react 
to the um, to the actions uh, of the West. First of all, let's have a little bit the case brought today by Kim Proposition. First of all, we believe today that they have taken a huge burden of them in terms of proving that they are going to, through these motions to solve other problems uh, than Eastern Europe as well. We believe today that this debate should be just about this should be this one of the top priorities of the next U.S. Pres uh, president or sh uh, it should not. Well, the first point of rebuttal, which is about strengthening the alliances and its importance. We believe today that it is very important to clarify the fact that those this process of strengthening the relations is mainly characterized by aggression, is mainly characterized by basically trumping on the influence that every other country acknowledges that Russia has on certain countries in certain Europe. We are talking especially about Romania, Poland, and the Baltic states, which are members of the NATO alliance, and at the end of the day, they have to stand by, uh, they have to stand in front of Russia and protect the whole um, uh, NATO, NATO alliance from it. And we believe today that this uh, process of strengthening the alliances is characterized by aggression of the Western bloc, and this is how it is perceived by Russia. What we are talking about when we are when we say strengthening the relations, we are talking about the United States. I don't know building another missile defense system into one of the NATO countries. We are talking about U.S. deploying more troops into Romania and into Poland. We, this, those are the things that we are talking about uh, uh, of this process of strengthening the relations and how they are in themselves. They may may not be that aggressive intrinsically but uh, for the russian uh, for the russian people they are perceived as an aggression and we believe today that in the moment in which we are trying to keep the geostrategic balance of power in the region and we should take care of this because we do not want to upset either russia or either the western bloc so we will have to keep as in the cold war this uh, balance of powers we are not going to do this by this process of strengthening the relations which essentially is just an aggression the second point of them, but before that, go. The General Assembly has determined that the referendum in Ukraine, which Russia used to further their campaign... Okay, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, okay, sit down, please, sit down, please. Thank you. We believe today that we should not be talking about the eastern Ukraine and about Crimea, because what was happening there was the fact that, first of all, Russia protected the right to self-determination of a certain population in the eastern Ukraine, population which is speaking the Russian language, population which wanted to be part of Russia, first of all, and second of all, we believe that Ukraine was just uh, reactive towards the aggression of the Western Bloc towards Russia and towards its sphere of influence. Okay, getting into the, the other point about how we are going to save those, uh, uh, about how Team Proposition said that we are going to handle much better issues like Middle East and Pivot Asia and whatnot. We believe today that this debate should be entirely about should this be a top priority or not. We believe today that, yeah, sure, they can argue that they're going to solve those problems, but that is not relevant to this point of this debate, and we should not debate on this thing. Th no, thank you. Now, getting to my constructive. The first argument that Russia is just reactive towards Western threats. The statement of this argument is that USA's further, uh, further action will destabilize the balance of power in the region. How is this is going to happen? First of all, we have to take into account that Vladimir Putin has stated repeatedly that he wants to come to terms with the United States and he is willing to talk to the United States and to strengthen and ease those tensions that exist right now at a diplomatic level. So basically what happens it, is that we are going against his will to cooperate in the moment in which we are perpetrating as a Western bloc this aggression and we are placing missile defense systems in Romania and in Poland, the moment in which the U.S. is going to deploy, to, to, to deploy more and to basically double, double the number of soldiers in Romania in the year 2017 and uh, this, this aggression is going basically to just upset Russia who is willing and has declared itself to be uh, willing to come to terms with the United States, we're just going to shove them in, the, in, in their face, the, um, the missile defense system and the, um, um, and the other troops and tanks and so on. So, basically, what we see that Vladimir Putin has said, he said the following things, you know, that defensive missile defense system can be defensive or can be offensive depending just by the type of rockets that you put in it. And that's just, it's not a standalone system. It's a system that, first of all, blocks missiles. Second of all, launch another missiles towards the enemy. Third of all, blocks a nuclear threat. And fourth of all, is launching another nuclear threat towards Russia. We believe today that Vladimir, that Vladimir Putin is willing 
to come to terms with the United States has declared these things, and we should not pay, uh, and, and we should not upset and and be aggressive towards Russia in the moment in which we, we want to, we want to keep and, and the U.S. president should want to keep the geostrategic balance of power in the region. Go. The fancy installments and military exercises of the West are transparent and uh, in accordance with international agreement. Russians are not. They are not reporting their uh, exercises. They are not reporting what they are building. Okay. They thank you. Much I got it. But I think that it is in the moment in which we are doing military exercises. That is a form of aggression as well. It does not mean that if it's transparent or it's not transparent, that is a form of aggression and it's for it's a form of shoving into their face our army. Look how powerful you, uh, we are. Look how can uh, look how prepared we are. Uh, we are and whatnot. And going into my second argument, which is about the influence of a cultural factors, and we have state we, we have to state that this is an even if argument, and even if in the sense in which even though uh, even if the uh, proposition team can prove to you that Russia is not reactive, but it is active in these threats, this argument is going to prove to you how we cannot defuse the threat from the Eastern Europe as the United States. First of all, we believe that <clears throat> Russia has a huge influence, culturally speaking, on Eastern Europe. We have language elements, we have political ideology elements, we have in, for example, countries like Romania, Poland, and whatnot, a lot of influence from the communist era. People that, uh, people that praise the communists and praise the Soviets uh, because they think that the, at, at that specific time, those th times were, were better. So basically, what we see in this impact of this argument is that the population in the Western Europe cannot perceive Russia as a threat and cannot perceive Russia as an enemy in the moment in which those cultural factors and l language for example is deepened into uh, is deepened into their civilization so basically what we see is that we as a, as a, as the united states cannot shift this paradigm of the eastern european population into perceiving russia as a threat and at the end of the day what we are doing by this aggression and perpetrating those strengthening of relations is just going to destroy the balance of power anymore because the people do not believe in this strength for all those reasons today, I've never been so proud to oppose. Dear panel, team opposition in this debate would have us believe that first of all, Russia has no aggressive tendencies, even though the historical narrative points in the opposite direction, 180 degrees, no wish to like exploit power vacuums in Eastern Europe. They would have us believe things that like the Baltic states in Eastern Europe are very pro-Russian and like Litva, Latvia, Estonia, we're talking about the same Estonia that made a special militia force because they were afraid of Russian aggression and believe that the USA is not helping them enough are willing to want to cooperate with Russia and would prefer to be Russian allies. They do not fear Russian aggression. Their world worldview is flawed and their worldview is incorrect. And we will present to you today how we are the ones that correctly characterize Russia's intentions, how we leave them no room for leverage, and how we allow the United States of America to properly pursue its foreign policy elsewhere, like providing peace in Syria and other places, strong and united as the Western bloc to bring to bring human rights and freedom to all. So, how am I going to structure my speech in the following way? I would like to start by rebuilding certain, no thank you, targeting certain rebuttals that they have provided us, while at the same time talking a bit about their arguments and why those are infeasible. And then I would like to talk about my third argument, where I correctly analyze the sentiments of how people feel about Russia, how people feel about the USA, and what kind of political leanings this has given certain countries in Eastern Europe, while they are harmful to America, world peace in general, and to the countries themselves. No thank you. And how we can stop them. So first of all, they said, first of all, our line has been very clear. We have to prove that Eastern European crisis is easier solved by, becoming strong, by strengthening alliances in Eastern Europe. 
They say that this strengthening is characterized by aggression. Now, first of all, strengthening of alliances is not necessarily building military bases. This is something that they tracked out. Although building military bases is a form that could be employed in certain countries where this is considered appropriate. We are not necessarily talking about militarily attacking Russia. Second of all, we need to comparison things. Sure, Russia might Sorry. raise its head. No, thank you. This is a, also tackles directly their first argument. Sure, if we build stronger alliances and become more friends with them, Russia might rear its head. Russia might throw up a tantrum. But the fact of the matter is that if we are strongly in these countries, Russia will not attack. The United States of America eclipses Russia like the sun does the moon in terms of military might. The United States of America is already closer, no thank you, but is closer ideologically to Eastern Russia than Russia is. We believe that if we take a strong stance in these countries, Russia will not dare escalate tensions, will not attack. The reason Russia did this in Ukraine is because in Ukraine, the USA did not take a strong position. What the USA did, it, what the Ukrainian people themselves decided to move away. The, U, the US did not provide them with enough support, and this left a power vacuum. Seeing a power vacuum, Russia, which has a historical tendency, no thank you, to want to intervene in those areas, intervened and took, and took land in Ukraine. Our point is that this escalate, that even if it might create certain tension short run, it is worth it because our second argument that they never tackled says how this is critical towards solving other problems in the world. Now let's compare that on our side where we do go in to their side where they don't go in, where if anything we move out, we cannot go further in, no thank you. This leaves a power vacuum and a hungry Russia, no thank you, on the other side, please stop barracking, that is more than happy to come in and aggress. And in this case, we are risking a much harder escalation. We are risking another Ukraine. We are risking Russia taking the opportunity that we are giving them to go in and cause even more trouble. So yes, we say go into these countries. We say build military bases if necessary. The second thing they talk about, no thank you, Russia's intentions. And they say that Russia has only the best of intentions. It was a fair referendum of their people. Now, first of all, you can't just, a foreign state can't just take over your land aggressively because a certain part of your country decided to have their own referendum. This referendum was deemed unfair by the UN General Assembly. So Russia had a significant influx of Russians was detected into the area before the referendum was held. The referendum was unconstitutional and it was unfair. And they would say that this is, they're actually legitimizing the attacks in Ukraine. They're legitimizing war in Europe after 50 years. War in Europe. Yes, please. You disagree? Was Vladimir Putin legit when he said that, Russia, that the USA does not respect their commitments when USA broke the anti-nuclear uh, treaty in 2002? Okay, so you give us one example of where the USA apparently did something wrong. We give you the example of Russia undemocratic attacking a state, going in with full military force, faking it, causing because of an undemocratic and unfair referendum as seen by the UN, and then refusing to apologize. Why is Russia going in? It's not because they want to liberate these people. Russia has got its own interests as a state, and these are the same as they were before. It wants to acquire land around its borders, satellite states, if you will. It wants influence where it can help to have control, leverage over Europe, perhaps destabilize Central Europe. It wants to have these countries for its own, say, so they can export oil into them. Russia's interests are clear. You cannot mischaracterize that. So, to continue, they talk about um, this first argument I've already talked about. Their second argument is about these cultural factors. Now, let's look at Poland, for example. What does the population of Poland look like? We're Poland, so we know. First of all, 59% is strongly against Russia. They consider Russia to be a significant threat to their country's national security. Second of all, 15% is strongly for Russia in a very radical manner. We see that the Russian support in these states, like, for example, in the pre-Baltic states, is generally of a is generally a radical minority. The, ma uh, the majority is either strongly against it or apathetic. You cannot say that because they are culturally similar, this somehow means that they would rather be with Russia, which has shown autocratic, expansionist, perhaps exploit and exploitative tendencies in the places such as, for example, no thank you, if we look down south in Georgia, not just Ukraine, rather than with the West, which they would gladly ally with and have shown before that they would like to if the West was willing to do this, if the West took a stronger hand and could guarantee them protection from Russian escalations on the other side. So, I think we've cleared this up. Their first, our first argument stand. We need to protect this, the Eastern Europe and we need to be able to focus on other things after we have solidified at home so we can be a strong Western bloc. Their arguments do not. These are not necessarily aggressions, and even if they are, if they are, even if they are perceived as aggressions by Russia, they are preferable to the alternative. And these cultural factors, do, and these countries would rather ally with the USA than with Russia, and they do absolutely perceive Russia as a threat. Most of Ukraine was not willing to go get attacked by Russia with the military. Please. All right. So to move on to my arguments. 
Now, we would like to stop the trend of these dangerous radical thought sentiments. And let's look at what these sentiments are. Let's analyze Eastern Europe a bit and see what they look like. Well, I see two camps, like two major radical camps. You have Russia-file camps, which are very pro-Russian, autocratic, and in the majority of states, these are like a very small, these are a small radical minority. But then you have states like Belarus, which is pretty much very pro-Russian because of the current regime is being supported by Russia. These are very pro-Russian, generally in the minority, and very anti-USA, because they believe that Russia is who they should ally with. On the other side, you have Russia phobes, which I would talk about would be, for example, the, po the, the radical right in Poland, which stages these massive protests, um, where they have the paramilitary arm that trains under the bridges, like was recently disclosed by Vice in a news report. And the fact of the matter is, these are, these are also against Russia, but at the same time, they mistrust the USA, because the USA has failed to intervene, it has failed to show support. What does this mean? This means that they want to go it alone. They believe that Poland should stand strong like a nation, and they support Polish nationalism. The problem is, these are both two very autocratic ideologies we see on both sides. And this, what this would lead, and what the rise of these ideologies is leading to, first of all, the USA loses its ideological alliance. It loses its friendship with these states, which become ever more distrusting of the USA and Russia, or the, just the USA. At the same time, it's, these two sides may, are in between each other are in constant conflict. So it increases tensions in Eastern Europe that could lead to escalations of violence. It could even lead to conflict between states. It could lead to Europe being politically divided to a degree where it can no longer help the USA intervene. So... We, if we, we need to strengthen alliances and protect them from Russia because this is, what they, this is why they are moving away from us. We need to solidify our ideological hold on these places as the United States of America so that they can remain not autocratic states. And most importantly of all, we must strengthen our alliances with these states. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that it is the job of team government today to prove to us that the arguments that they bring have a mechanism behind them and moreover that they actually function in real life. That if we try to build those alliances, we're actually going to succeed. Because as you speak for right now, you are acting just like all we need is to like friend request them on Facebook and they're going to want to be in an, 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 an alliances with us. But it doesn't work like that. Just as you so said, people there are torn apart between two strong parts. People there have really strong beliefs. You need to prove to us today how pushing the limit in those countries, how trying to get to like get friendly with those countries is actually going to work and is actually be going to be sustainable because it doesn't matter that the governments will approve even though we believe that most governments won't but what matters is the people if the people don't approve of what's happening in those countries it's useless what you're trying to talk about it's useless to try and force it a few rebuttal points before I go into my constructive. First of all, their first argument wasn't even an argument, okay? It was just an example that was based on Crimea and how Crimea didn't have any, like, precedent and thus Russia is not, is a perpetrator and it's not a reactor. After the Cold War, we all decided that we're not going to get on Russia's nerves. We're not going to get in its area of uh, influence. And we're not going to try to get countries like Romania, like Ukraine, and other countries to get in NATO, to get in European Union. What did we do? We did get Romania in NATO. We did try to push other countries to go and uh, sign for the European Union, which is a symbol of the West, which is the symbol of the uh, West influence, right? That's what we reacted to. The fact that all those countries that are so close to Russia got in the influence of the West all of a sudden. It's not, it doesn't have, they didn't react to something that happened yesterday, but they did react to a general uh, um, forcing of, of barriers, forcing of influence, and so on and so forth. It is false. You didn't bring any mechanism. All you did was bring an example that wasn't even well analyzed. Now let's talk about other global problems, because if you really want to get that in your burden, you should feel welcome to do it. It's a huge burden that you have to prove today. We believe that that's simply not how international relationships work, because if Russia will feel like it's losing ground in Eastern Europe, it's not going to be like, 
Oh, better stop fighting in Syria. Better stop funding Assad. Better and try and like chill a little bit in Middle East. No, that's not gonna happen. If they notice that they're losing ground in Eastern Europe, they're gonna try and fight in other places and try and uh, win some ground in other places, creating more tensions, more areas in which you know America, the police of the world, will still have to fix. The second part of your argument was combating China with economic power. What you don't understand is that Eastern Europe is highly dependent, economically speaking, uh, on Russia, right? Because of natural gas, because Russia makes huge investments in Eastern Europe. It's not like we can just like create economical alliances on them without Russia's approval, without wanting Russia on our, our side. Is Russia going to be on our side when we, uh, like, put more military there, when we threaten it, when we go there and push for our influence to be uh, stuck in that place, no, it's not gonna like it. It's not gonna wanna be our friend. A few reconstructive points. First of all, they said that no, Russia, um, Russia doesn't work like that. Russia is just imperialistic and so on and so forth. Well, we believe that the reason why Russia is so imperialistic is because of the US doing the same thing, right? Because we live in the same atmosphere that we did in the Cold War and we are in a constant fight for power and influence. In the moment in which Vladimir, Vladimir Putin sees that you are putting military bases in areas which a few years ago weren't even to touch, that's the moment when Russia feels threatened. That's the moment when you feel like uh, you should be doing something. Uh, yeah. We believe this is irrelevant because Russia will never directly attack an area in which there is a US military base. Really? Okay. <laughs> right, it doesn't have to attack that particular part. But you know what happened after we put that um, missile defense system? We got even worse in Poland, okay, in Kaliningrad, which is a part of Poland, aggressions got worse, uh, uh, um, military got worse, and we had even more military action in that area. It doesn't have to respond in the same place. And what is this? Like, it's never gonna try, try us because, like, we're so good with our military. They are building their military equipment as well, right? They're not doing it because they want to keep it for fun. They're doing it because they want to fight back, because they want to say something. It's not just for a nuclear museum, right? Okay, now, going into your extension in which you said there their, their conflict, and it doesn't even bring a mechanism how you're gonna fix those conflicts. They're so profound and so cultural in those areas. And you're talking about how those people that are pro-Russia are a minority. In Moldova, people refuse to speak Romanian sometimes because if you don't know Russian, they say that you should be knowing Russian. And they say that, no, Romanian is not our language. Romanian is for the West and so on and so forth. This is how strong the culture Cultural barriers are. How are you gonna come as America that have no idea about their culture, that don't understand it, that doesn't even have a cultural program, and like fix the problem, fix the conflict? Is the, if those groups are as radical as you talk about them, well, it is impossible for you to get mixed in and fix them. We don't see a mechanism. You haven't proved anything, just said words like leverage and uh, Crimea, and that's not an argument, okay? Let's get into my substantive about how we believe that those countries actually work. And it's actually very similar with your extension because you did a lot of my job explaining about how um, those countries are so strongly divided. Now, why are those countries so strongly divided? Because even though Russian, Russia is a important part of their culture and many times they, they want to get close to it, what happens is that the West still has its benefits, right? It has a lot of economic benefits. It offers a lot of power or at least the image of power that NATO and the United, uh, the Euro uh, European U Union has and so on and so forth, right? It has a really good image. People want to go to the West, some of them. 
But in the moment in which they see that being in NATO, being in the sphere of influence is not about making your own choices, it's not about being more strongly economically, it's about like listening to the US do whatever it wants in its country. We have Romania as a really got good model how people were actually quite mad that overnight we had this like uh, offensive system that nobody was asked for. In that moment, people start believing that, you know, this is a risky move. We have Russia right next to our borders. Those guys just want to make us fight for them. We are not important for them. We're just a tool for them. They're never going to want to get into NATO. They're never going to want to go into uh, the United, uh, uh, the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, Russia is not a perpetrator. Russia is only a reactor. Please don't vote them. So to finish off, I shall talk about a triad of points you know, to, to discuss how this debate should go. First of all, I shall talk about the stabilization of Eastern Europe, like who's the aggressor, how do we make it sure that there's no war coming on anytime soon. Second of all, I shall talk about why do we need Eastern Europe? Why is Eastern Europe a relevant factor in this debate? Finally, I'm going to talk about cultural and macro-political situation that Eastern Europe currently has. But before that, I have to do a reality check because side opposition probably didn't do the research right because the things that they were saying in the last speech are factually incorrect. Now they said that, you know what, making allies is just like sending a friend request. Sadly for them, we, are all, we already are allies with the majority of Eastern Europe. Poland is in NATO. Baltic states are in NATO. We are, they are, uh, half of them are in EU. They are already major allies of us. They have been major allies of the US, of the West for the past 20 years. So them saying, like, how are you going to make them allies is not relevant in this debate. They already are our allies. But why do we have this debate then? Why is this motion relevant if they are already our allies? No, thank you. It is relevant because Obama, for the past eight years, has been neglecting the region. It's been relevant because both Hillary Clinton and Donald J. Trump were saying that they are going to move their attention away from Eastern Europe because the attention of the Western forces has been shifting away from, the, from, the, from alliances in Eastern Europe. We are having this debate. No, thank you. Please stop barracking. So now that we have this, let's talk about Ukraine and the Eastern Europe. Like what happened, now, what happened the past eight years was escalations that we've never seen before. From 208 on, we've seen Georgia happen, where Russia invaded another country. We've seen Ukraine happen, where Russia went against the international law, was condemned by the international organizations such as the UN. Like, the e Eastern Europe is in shambles, and now let's analyze why stronger military presence, stronger economical and political presence of the West, of the US, shall be a, a key to make that better. But first of all, negation of like how Russia is just a reactor. Let's talk about, first of all, military exercises and missile defense system. Yeah, there was one built in Poland, but that was a protection from North Korean and Iranian defense system. It is targeted to protect and target those two countries, not Russia at all. Please stop barracking. Furthermore, when NATO performs military exercises and places missile defense systems, it reports them. It reports them to the UN. It makes sure it's very transparent what they're doing, who is performing the exercises, when, where, how, why, all those, all those things that are important. When Russia does that, they don't do that. They don't report any of the military exercises. They have bigger military exercises. They have more missile defense systems, more attack missile uh, systems, but they never report them. And you know what happened to 12? Russia had a nuclear submarine military exercise, the biggest that we have seen in the 21st century. You know where it was staged? In the Gulf of Mexico. So if they're seeing Eastern Europe as an aggression, Russia's aggression is much further. Now let's talk about Ukraine. Ukraine was a country that wanted to negotiate and enter the European Union. And then when the protest happened, the escalation, Russia staged a referendum. The referendum was internationally uh, determined to be undemocratic, unfair, illegitimate. Like the General Assembly of the UN, which is pretty much the highest authority you can have, determined it was not okay. But Russia invaded. It performed a sort of a, an Anschluss. Uh, 
to remind you of some other similar events. They went to Georgia in 208. They fought a war against a different country. How is that not a microaggression? And when we, we are talking about nuclear weapons and about who is like breaking any laws and uh, agreements and stuff, USA currently have 1,500 active nuclear warheads. Russia had 2,800. Like, in any example, if the West is aggressive, the Rus Russia is more aggressive. Russia is not a reactor in this case. Would you disagree? You are not here to prove that Russia is more bad than the USA. You are here to prove that Russia will be more, less offensive in your case, and you are not proving coming, that. Coming right up. So, when we know that Russia is aggressive, it has been aggressive for the past eight years, we have to examine why they were aggressive. And we can see that they were aggressive because they had a chance to be. They had power vacuums that they could fill. They had Ukraine, which was losing support of the Western allies. The military exercise that they, were, that they were able to perform is because they're not scrutinized, because they had the uh, opportunity. And we are telling you, and we explain to you how stronger alliances with them are going to make an invasion or any other aggressions less likely. Because Russia is not likely to go into an open conflict against the West. It is not an, a realistic thing that can happen. They can go into Ukraine when there is no one around to keep watch on what they're doing. They cannot go there if they're strong allies with the NATO, with the USA, with the West. This is why if a strong alliance uh, and nurturing our alliances is going to make sure that aggressions are less likely to happen. And to compare what happens if we, if we make the uh, alliances like worse, if we neglect them. What happens is that Russia is going to be much more able to do anything because Russia has expansionary tendencies. And if we just leave them, with no checks and balances, with no scrutiny, with no one to take care of what they're doing, they're going to be able to take the opportunity and expand further. Second point, no thank you. Why do we need Eastern Europe? And this is an argument that they, in many cases, neglected. We explained to you how uh, Eastern Europe is the biggest and only open conflict that we have with Russia. Like in the Middle East, we are not in a direct clash with Russia. And actually, in the recent times, more and more talks of cooperation were started. The same goes for other examples. And, but we are say, telling you that in every other conflict, when we are talking with Russia, about anything, they have the leverage of Eastern Europe hanging over our heads. And if we take that leverage away by making sure that the country is stabilized and strong, like the, the region is sta stabilized, and we have strong alliances there, the leverage that they have is gone. The same goes for like uh, fighting other conflicts, talking about other problems. If we want to be, as the West, able to tackle other issues, we need to have a strong uh, situation back home. We, we mustn't have a Europe that is torn apart. We explained to you in the, in the second and third argument how currently the situation in the Eastern Europe is because of negligence of the alliances deteriorating and how we are less able to perform in international waters if we don't have strong uh, alliances back home. So them saying that Russia is going to be more radical in the Middle East when they're going to lose leverage is not realistic. Them saying that we, can, we can't just start new economic relations is not realistic. The fact is that if we have a strong and stable Europe, strong and stable Eastern Europe, we're going to be much more able to, as the West, perform in international relations. Final point I would like to talk about is the point about cultural things, right? And they talk about how people want to speak Russian, how people want to learn Russian, which is false. During Soviet era, they were Russified, which means that they, they had to learn Russian. They were forced and uh, fed Russian culture, and they hate Russia for that. Majority of the population in those countries is strongly against Russia. But what happens when the USA is, ne ne uh, is neglecting the alliances? What happens when they have refugee waves? What happens is that the radical right-wingers become afraid. They're already afraid of Russia. Some of them are as a small minorities for Russia. They're afraid of the fact that the West is not supporting them anymore, which is why political instabilities happen. This is how political instabilities happen, happen in Ukraine. Because they, uh, a, a conflict started, and this is how uh, uh, the power of vacuum talked, we talked about earlier happened. If we want to prevent that from happening any, anytime soon, we need to have strong and stable political situation, which is why we need to reassure them, make sure that we are allied. Team Proposition had a very simple stance. We, we told you that Russia is expansionary, that we can see that from examples and from analysis. We told you that Russia is not like a freight reactionary force, but they have their interest of their own. And we told you that a strong military presence is a thing to deter them from, from, from causing harm because they're not going to go into open conflict. We explained to you how a stable, politically and economically stable Eastern Europe is crucial for our advantages and exploits around the world because we need to have a stable situation back home in order to be able to go further to, to other places and try our business there. Because of all those reasons, please propose.
I find it pretty funny that by the end of this debate they conceded to the idea that Russia won't actually intervene in Eastern Europe, but they want to strengthen the position and to give more friend requests and more likes on Facebook just because they want to put leverage, a concept they have never actually explained and analyzed in this debate. This is why they are actually they haven't actually touched the metric of this debate, which was the balance of power and the peace being maintained in the Eastern Europe. Two, two points I'll be talking about. First of all, about Russia, and second of all, about USA interest and how, how we should act in Eastern Europe. Firstly, about Russia. And let's analyze examples like Vietnam, like Korea, like Iraq, like Afghanistan. In all these examples, Russia has been a more a bad actor than the US DSA. But we are not here to analyze that. We are here if, uh, to see if our actions and the Russia's response were worth. We are, he uh, he we are here to analyze if you want to do more actions and be uh, aware of the Russian response. And we, Mr. S we, Madam Speaker, say that we are not. We are not, a, we are not willing to give uh, Russia more rhetoric. We are not here to fuel their intentions in order to say okay USA has no has no right in intervening there so I'm going to militarily intervene myself we are saying that this kind of rhetoric is not beneficial for an international context and we are saying that yes maybe Russia is uh, is actually uh, behaving worse than us but we are here not to punt uh, actually uh, uh, fuel their intention more about uh, this kind of issue we are see we are here to uh, we we are saying that they have actually put up problem on the table they are not solving they have been talking about ukraine and crimea but they are it's not like they are going to take crimea back it's not like they are going to in militarily intervene in ukraine and if so they should be telling us so but if they if they are not doing so, we are seeing that the problem isn't actually solved by their motion. The problem of uh, instability in countries like Republic of Moldova or uh, Ukraine is not solved by strengthening the position in countries like Romania because they have no offered no analysis on how this mission actually functions. No, thank you. Their first argument on how this is the most crucial, uh, their first argument about how this is the most crucial problem in uh, international context actually was a hunk argument because they have and present an, any mechanism by which the motion actually solves these kind of problems. These kind of problems are be, exist because Russia reacts to our intentions and their mechanism was lacking in telling us why Russia, when seeing the military force empowered by the West, will go and say, okay, okay, now I'm going to be the good guy because I'm afraid because you have brought uh, two more missiles there. We are saying that Russia does not essentially react that way on the international level. Let's talk about their second argument about other priorities. And we are saying that their argument is arguing on our side. Why? Because exactly, there are other threats like, I don't know, Middle East, like the problems in Asia that should be prioritized and can't be prioritized in their side of the house because, you know, we have a limit on the military budget, even so USA has a lot of money. We are saying that their argument is actually not staying exactly because we are not seeing a mechanism by which we can prioritize also Middle East if we prioritize uh, this kind of conflict, but more than that, we are saying that essentially every time in Cold War when Russia was not able to directly engage with the West because the, the, it was not possible on international level, they were only searching for proxy wars, exactly like Korea and Vietnam, in order to engage with the West. And we are saying that these kind of actions are not re are not beneficial for the society. Go. What exactly then does your side say? Okay, Russia's intention in Eastern Europe is threatening and putting leverage. At the moment you are giving them the rhetoric and the reason to put leverage, you are not going to get a better situation, but rather Vladimir Putin that saying in a legitimate way, in other way, that okay, USA is threatening me because they are actually giving, wanting to invade my allies, so I'm going to defend myself. We are saying that is regrettable, that in every case of intervention, even their rhetoric was wrong from the Western policy, their rhetoric was still standing. You, uh, the Russia was ever was always able to say that okay, okay, I'm the one that should be defended, so I'm going to uh, militarily act in order to be defended. More than that, we are saying that even USA has acted in a way that sh in they shouldn't be acted when they broke the ABM treaty in 2002. We are saying we are saying that this kind of uh, acts actually give them uh, the rhetoric and the reason to say these kind of things. And more than that, we are saying that even though we don't like the referendum in Crimea, those 
those kind of actions are actually legit. The people in Crimea actually wanted to be with Russia, even the referendum, even if the referendum was not legitimized by the UN, and we should accept and take in concordance these kind of actions and act in concordance with them. We should, we should be more mature and we shall understand the international context and we shall take an action that actually solves the international context and actually touch the metric of, metric of this debate, the peace in Eastern Europe. If you have any few eyes. Yeah, like we explained to them how Russia was openly aggressive when they had a power vacuum to fill. They told us that Russia has a more threatening rhetoric when there's strong Western presence. We asked the panel, what's a better thing okay. to have? The single reason for which Russia was not active in instantly after 1990s was because they have an economic situation that didn't allow them to militarily intervene in Eastern Europe. As, as soon as they got an economic situation that was better after the, twen the, 2000, the year of 2000, they got a military intervention in uh, countries like um, North Ossetia or in countries like Crimea. We are saying that this is, what, this is not related to the Western position. Let's talk about the West. And we are saying that this kind of country countries are actually divided, but more than that we are saying that these kind of countries are actually sensible to any rhetoric. We are saying that these kind of countries, countries like Moldova or uh, Ukraine, f f live with the threat in 50 kilometers that Russia might attack me in three hours. We are saying that this kind of fear actually is materialized at the moment the West comes and tells, okay, I'm not here to essentially protect you and give my, you my best values, but I'm here to use you in my conflict with Russia. We are saying that this kind of rhetoric actually f makes the population feel worse, actually makes the population hate the Western values and ha makes the population actually portray the USA as an agent that's not better than the Russia, but only wants to fight Russia and are using their countries for their selfish purpose of gaining influence. But more than that, we are saying that all these countries actually are a sensible way and need a sensible way of acting and intervening. And at the moment you give them this kind of measure, you are not going to solve the problem. You are not going to help the Moldavian people at the moment you are going to sell them, okay, if you want my Western values, if you want my human rights, then you have to be with me in the, uh, in the conflict with Russia. Russia, you are, they are not going to like this measure at the moment, they are not going to see help this your help, but rather see the Russian people that are there at the border and can attack in every single time. We are saying that this is the countries we are talking about and they, for them you are not solving the problem. Let's clarify the debate and see what they have brought to the table and how, why they didn't prove the motion. Their motion was not touching, touching the metric of this debate. Their motion wasn't bringing peace in the Eastern Europe. Their motion was not to put Russia on a more defensive stand, but rather provoke them. And uh, f uh, their motion actually didn't give a benefit to those countries. Our side of the house has actually explained how we are actually giving them a beneficial, how we are actually making more peace in Eastern Europe. And for all the reasons, I have never been so proud to oppose. <laughs> to look at three main points in this debate. First of all, I'm going to look at the question, is Russia somebody that reacts or is it just a random aggressor? Second of all, is it going to work, what they're trying to do and what they say that it should be a priority? And third of all, are the problems that you are solving that we think that the government hasn't even barely started to prove to us today? Okay, first question, is Russia somebody that reacts or just a random aggressor? Now, we believe that the more important part of the debate is right now, if you're going to do this, how is Russia going to react? Is it going to be more aggressive or is it going to be nice and say no, 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 now that you have all those missiles, all this nuclear power there, we're just going to stand by and not do anything? That's the right question. They didn't provide us with analysis in which they in which they have explained why Russia won't do that, or why it is worth it to start a more aggressive conflict or a more dangerous conflict. They didn't tell us that in any second. Moreover, the reason why they want to intervene is because Russia is being aggressive and violent in that area. What do we do? We intervene. We make it more angry at us. We make it more aggressive in the area in order for it to actually want to protect its area. Neither by your metric of the 
of the debate, which is peacekeeping and stability, do you manage to prove anything? Let's see in our method of the debate if we do manage to prove something. We believe we do, because the question that we put today is how do we keep the balance of the powers, right? We, the answer to that is we give some space. We let Eastern Europe to Russia so it doesn't become, so the conflicts there don't get worse, so it doesn't get more aggressive, so we don't create an active war zone in that area. We believe that on that part, we explained you that first of all, the balance of powers is important, and second of all, that this is the most. The only answer that they said was, no, Russia didn't think that the missile um, offensive system was for them. It was for North Korea. Come on, who actually bought that, OK? Vladimir Putin didn't buy that. He actually said, we don't believe that you're protecting yourself from Iran. We don't believe that you're protecting yourself from North Korea. We believe that you are against us, and we are going to fight back. He actually said that in a few interviews, guys. Nobody actually bought that in any moment. But second point about, is it going to work? Because they say, like, we don't really live in real life and we need a reality check because those countries are our, already our allies. If this would be so simple, you guys didn't, wouldn't have to prove anything, right? If it would be so easy for you to say, they're already our friends, they already want our help, we just need to go and give it to them. No, that's not the situation. You need to provide us with analysis in which you explain how this is going to work, how they're going to want our attention and our um, alliances. Because even though the government might even have like strong political alliances, you said in your extension how like big the conflicts are in those countries, how um, uh, dangerous the conflicts between the minorities and the majorities are. You so said that the situation there, at least culturally, is so impossible to deal with that, you know, we might as well not intervene. But third of all, other problems that you are solving. The reason why I left this one out is because they didn't even provide us with a mechanism. All they said was, Russia is using Eastern Europe as leverage, and because of that, they can manipulate us into something else. They didn't provide us with analysis in which they explained us how exactly Russia is going to stop its action in Middle East in a moment in which it feels like it's endangered. If it's truly the agent uh, that reacts to, th it, to things, if it's truly the agent that we see Russia being, then it's not going to work. We're not going to make it stop funding uh, Assad. We're not going to stop making anything bad. Ladies and gentlemen, they didn't provide any mechanism, any analysis. And as a government, it was their job to do so. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let us examine what happened in this debate. What are the burdens? Where did this debate happen? And why we win? Firstly, they had had a very interesting case. In their case, throughout their case, they were arguing in the, in the spirit of Russia is OK and defending Russia on all fronts. But this is not the case that we're debating here. We're debating why are those alliances a US international priority? And they have largely failed to show how, for example, even if they were right and Russia was the aggressor, that wouldn't make it more of a US international priority to deal with, right? Like, even if that w would be the case, how exactly does that prove, or would they prove, that this makes it less of a priority, not more? Their entire case was built on things like, who provides balance between powers in the region? Well, first, this is not about the power in the region in a sense of who provides better balance. We're not here to say that balance is completely necessary. And fur furthermore, what balance? In this sense, currently, the balance is such that Russia can invade Ukraine. That's the balance we have. That's the balance we're not willing to secure and continue providing. We want to break the balance. We want the US to take a strong stance. And we want the US to protect its allies that it promised to protect and form new ones to be able to protect its interests. So let's go on. They talk. So that's why it's a priority. Further, they try to paint Russia as a victim in this debate. The Russian bear as the victim. Come on. Like, first of all, uh, saying that Russia is protecting its borders 
is absurd. Who's protecting its borders are Ukraine and other countries afraid of Russia. Those are people who are defending their homes and should have all the right to connect with the US to f help fight this. This is what debate is about. Like, saying that Russia is the one in danger here is kind of bizarre considering they just invaded a, a sovereign nation, right? Further on, a reality check. When we see that even if Russia is the victim, does, it, does that make it less of a US priority to deal with? Again, another point that they really hammered in, but doesn't make a difference or an impact in this debate. Further on, alliances prevent ra uh, the rise of radical political options in Eastern Europe that are against, against US interests. Our whole third argument works almost completely ignored. Like, they neglected it completely, but we have a huge impact, and I'm going to repeat it for you. Firstly, US has interest in Eastern Europe, right? Without alliances, they're losing their position to Russia. Countries are afraid of Russia and are giving in to Russian demands, making the US lose their position, which is against their interest. Therefore, it is in US priority to make strong alliances so they can retain their position. Almost no response there. So again, this is the priority. Furthermore, can alliances be built? Their whole mechanistic attacks are ridiculous. Why? Because we provided you with clear reasoning why this would work from the beginning of this debate. And we didn't even think it was necessary to explicitly state it as that, because obviously, first, most countries are already allies or are potential allies in the region. And even those countries have been for the past eight years allies on paper, because US is the one not providing support. It is the US that was weak and reluctant, not the countries that don't want to connect with it. The only reason those countries would be reluctant to connect to US and try to work with them is because they don't trust the US to fulfill its obligations, because alliances are not strong enough to make them believe they will protect them against Russia. This is the reason why there could be a, a, a backlash towards alliances with the US. And we believe that the mechanism is established from the very beginning. Strong alliances are a priority because we have a historical foundation for those alliances and safeguarding can be quickly implemented and effective. So in conclusion, Vladimir Putin can say whatever he wants. We provide Europe, uh, Eastern Europe uh, with protection and stop loss of human lives. We ensure the stability in the region by saying no to Russia very loudly and publicly. We stop and weaken Russia and we give space to other conflict resolution. And guess what? Those are all US interests, which makes it a priority. Thank you.